Today we're going to be talking about this fancy Godox light here, the QT1200 2 M. M is in, my God, this thing is big. And we're just basically going to go through it, take a look at what, uh, what makes it tick, show you what all the buttons do. And in a future show, we'll be doing some actual photos with it so we can see what kind of light we're getting off of it. But this one, today's show, is all about the features, what it can do, what it's all about. I just wanted to show you the way that it comes in a box. It's kind of interesting. This, this glass cover here is actually not attached when it arrives. You, I think you want to be real careful with this. Uh, this is the modeling lamp that is also not attached, just comes in a box. And it comes with this cover on it. And this cover can be used, obviously, at any point in the studio to protect it, whatever. But you'll notice, which is kind of odd, you get this glass cover and you very carefully slide, oop, not like that, slide that into place. It is, it is glass, don't, don't break it. The modeling lamp protrudes past the front of it, which is a little bit weird, but it's okay. If you do put the protective case back on it, then that is protecting it, of course. So this case, incidentally, it's a Bowens mount, standard Bowens mount. It comes with a standard reflector as well with the same Bowens mount. So it makes it really easy to just put on whatever attachments you're going to put on. If you're gonna put a standard reflector on there, it just slides right on, snaps into place, super, super easy. There is also on here, a hole for a uh, umbrella. So if you want to do a shoot through or reflective umbrella, there is a hole right there to slide that into, slide the post of that into. Let's turn this thing around to the back and see what it can do. Power switch, of course, turn that thing on. Um, we're actually going to start with this one here, the buzz button. When I turn that on, it is the beep that allows you to know that the flash has recycled. However, it is also the beep that beeps every time you rotate a knob or turn a button. So test fire, you know it's, it beeps, tells you it's recycled, that's great, but also every knob you so we're going to turn that off i'm just gonna i'm gonna turn that off just because i think that's really kind of a bit much it has three different modes you push these to cycle through them you have your high speed sync mode which is in theory a really really awesome thing but it's not working at least not properly so it has three modes high speed sync a multi stroboscopic mode and the standard manual mode let's start by talking a little bit about high speed sync because it's not working properly at least it's not working properly with my setup so i am using the x pro trigger to control this thing this has radio control built in use the x pro trigger and you can remotely trigger this from your camera, which is great because you can also control it. You can adjust the output from here. We'll talk a little bit about how that connection goes on, but you can do all of that from your camera, which I got to say in itself is absolutely huge. I'm used to monoblocks where I literally have to climb up on a ladder to make power adjustments to my lights. The ability to do this from the camera itself is wonderful. I realize this isn't new tech, it's just new to me and it makes me happy. First of all, there's two things, uh, two things to know. You can enable high speed sync from this. But at this point, that's not working. Now, to be fair, I have reached out to Godox and explained what's happening, what isn't happening, asked some questions. They haven't gotten back to me. I didn't want to delay the show again. And so we're going for it. Um, if they come back to me with, with good answers of how to work around these, how to fix these, um, which I seriously doubt they will, be able to say that because I think that there are some actual problems in here. Hopefully, they will be able to issue a software update and we'll get these fixed. But the problems that we have, the first one that's an easy one, it doesn't really matter, is when you enable high-speed sync on the remote, it doesn't actually enable it on here. So you could be on your remote controlling it, thinking that you've gone into high speed and you haven't. You do have to actually go over here and hit the mode button and cycle into high speed sync. Okay, no big deal. But once you're in high speed sync mode, mm, something's wrong. Okay, let's take a look at the pictures here that I took yesterday. On the first test, this looks fine. But then I, I kind of, I don't know where I saw it out of the corner of my eye, some slight banding. I thought, hold on a second. I started lowering the exposure. Now this is the same flash output, just getting darker and darker. And you can see that there is a real band happening in here. And then this is a different flash output. I think this is a higher power. Stopping down the lens is how I was controlling the light input. And you can see that band down at the bottom there again as well. So this is one output level. I forget the level, doesn't really matter, but I tested one output level. We got the banding, tested another one. We're getting the banding in there. So there is something wrong with the high speed sync. It is not perfectly in sync. Sorry to open with a bummer, but that's it's a, it's a major feature of here that isn't quite working right, but hopefully that'll get fixed. But with that I said, let's move on to the next feature. Incidentally, when you're in high-speed sync mode, your lowest power setting is 1 16th. If you go any lower, it goes to off, and so 1 16th to full power. You'll see when we go into manual control that we have a lot more control than that, a lot more options. 
Let's go to the multi-mode next. Multi-mode is so neat. So first of all, you have your power. So you can take the power all the way down to 128. So there's your lowest power all the way up to eighth power. And then here you have two different numbers that tell you your, uh, your hertz, your frequency, how many shots per second you're getting, and how many shots you're going to do total. To adjust that, you push on the set button and you start rotating. So I can say, let's do, say I want to do 10 in a second. So I'll bring that up to 10. And then I go over here and I see how many bursts am I going to get. Now at this point, the maximum is two because my power is so high. So let's actually take this down a little bit. Let's take the power all the way down to the lowest setting. And now I can take this all the way up to 50 different, 50 bursts. So that'd be 50 bursts at 10 bursts per second if I go at 128th power. And you might be thinking, okay, that's, that's great. But then how do I like know, how do I plan a shot? Because the kind of things where you use this, this is the, you know, the dancer in the air where you want to have a single exposure, pop, 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 multiple flashes as they fly through the air. You probably want to plan it. And that's why you want to be able to plan how many shots per second and then how many fires total you're going to get. So how do you plan knowing with what power and so on? There's a chart. Maximum stroboscopic flashes. This is in the manual, of course. And so, for example, if you want 10 hertz, so 10 per second, and you want to fire off 20 frames, you can go to 164th power. If you drop down 1 128th power, you can get 50 frames. And so you just get a nice little chart here that tells you exactly how many frames you can fire off, which is pretty neat. The next mode is your full manual, your standard manual mode. So again, 1 128th is your lowest power. Incidentally, you keep seeing that off. That's because I rotate too far. It just turns it off all the way up to full power. Now there's a very interesting other number that is showing up on here. And that's this right here, the T to 0.1. So that's T for time at 0 0.1. I realize it looks like a letter O. It actually is a letter O. I don't know what they were thinking, but it's T 0 0.1. And this is the time that it takes for the strobe, for the light output, to get to 10% of its nominal output, of its maximum output. So this is a fraction. This is 1 over 180th of a second at full power. And you might be thinking, 180th of a second? Hold on a second. That's, that's really long. Right? Like my camera flash syncs faster than that at 250th of a second. And, and that's true. It does. So 180th of a second, that, that's a really long time. Well, remember that 180th of a second is time to 10%. And this is a really, really interesting thing to point out that is a very, very much a kudos to Godox. Most flash manufacturers list the time to 50%. It'll be a T equals 0 0.5 number. That is the time that it takes from the from basically off, from when the flash is off, to it fires and immediately spikes up. You get a really fast attack as it gets to its brightest point. And then the fall off of that is going to be a long curve. Most flash, flash manufacturers list the time to 50% because it's a shorter time and so it sounds more impressive. But the thing is, if you think about it, when your light is outputting at 50% of whatever you've set it to, that's still a lot of light. That is enough of light to affect your exposure. Time to 10%, though, 10% is barely, barely any light at all. You could do time to 0%, but it would be a much longer tail, and that's kind of not really relevant. So the two standards are time to 50%, T equals 0 0.5, or time to 10%, T equals 0 0.1. In this case, Godox is doing 0 0.1. Now, at full power, it's 1 over 180. That's a fraction, so 1 one eightieth. If I take this thing down to its lowest power, lowest, 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 lowest power, we get down to 1 over Three, with 1 3,852, 1 over 3,850, it's a lot of numbers. That's fast. Now that, at that light output, with that short duration, we're talking about really, really freezing motion. So that's the water drops in the sky, that sort of thing. And I ran some very simple tests yesterday just to make sure that I was fully understanding the numbers here. Just put the camera in a dark room, uh, put a one second long exposure, and fired the flash at full power, just shaking my hands like this to make sure we got motion. At full power, we definitely see motion blur. At the low power, it's completely frozen. Now, that number, 3,852th of a second, is fast. But it can actually get a lot faster. This strobe has two different modes. It has a color accurate mode and a speed mode. It's in the color accurate mode by default. And when we get into the custom function settings, I'm going to show you how to switch into the speed mode. And we'll talk a little bit more there about what happens when you do that. But suffice it to say, even though that sounds really fast, it can get dramatically faster still. OK, so those are the three modes. Your high speed sync mode, which is not really exactly working right now the multi-stroboscopic mode, and the standard manual mode. Just a brief interruption to remind you to check out photojoseph.com, where you'll find all of my YouTube videos organized by product, making it really easy to find exactly what you're looking for. You may also want to check out my live training, where I do deep dives on various photo and video apps, 
often resulting in hours and hours of training for those products. Also, be sure to check out the workshops page to see if there's any upcoming events you may want to join me on. And finally, while you're there, subscribe to the newsletter so you don't miss a thing. All right, now back to our show. Next up, you have S1, S2. This is for optical slave. S1 is a first fire sink. S2 is a second fire sink. What that means is if you are using this in a totally manual type environment, you're going to have this triggered by optical slave, which means some other flash, any other flash fires, and that makes this fire. If it's an S1, it fires when the flash fires. If it's an S2, it fires after the second pop, because a lot of flashes that you might have on camera that you might be using to trigger this will pre-flash. They'll fire a flash to meter exposure if you have the camera set to DTL. They'll fire a flash to meter and then fire a second one to actually expose. When you put it in S2, it will ignore that first flash and fire on the second one. Kind of a cool feature. Then there's the buzz and the modeling light. So modeling light on off, I push that, it comes on. We now see a percentage on here. If I push it again, that starts flashing and I can increase or decrease the percentage of that. So take it to 100% all the way down to 5%. If you want to turn it off, just press and hold for about two seconds, and that turns the modeling light off. You can incidentally control that from the remote here as well. That was another weird thing. I had to push the button to turn it on or off twice each time to get it to trigger, but it does control the modeling light. It will turn that on and off from the remote. Now, there's another thing that we're going to see when we get into the custom function settings, where you can have it set so that the modeling light stays on all the time, even when the flash fires, which is the default, or you can have it set so that the modeling light turns off when the flash fires, which I actually prefer. I don't want any chance, especially if I'm doing kind of a lower light, longer exposure photo, for the modeling light to interfere with the exposure or to somehow color tint the picture. It's, you know, it's definitely not a daylight balance bulb in there. I don't want that extra light. So I've programmed it to automatically turn off the modeling light when it takes the picture. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment here. Down the bottom, power, hard sync. So if you want to go really old school, plug in the sync and then Interesting, there's a USB port. It has a little Wi-Fi symbol on it, but that is kind of an old school way of doing wireless because this does have wireless built in. Um, but also I think that USB port can be used for software updates. All right, up to here. The very top one, multifunction button. This turns wireless on or off to start. So you see the wireless display has disappeared or come back on. It's also the custom function button. We'll come back to that. Down here, you have your group and channel settings. So now that I have wireless turned on, if I push this, it cycles through the different groups. Once it's flashing, I can actually use the dial as well. And so you have A through E and then 0 through 9 as well. So you have a lot of different settings in there. I use A, and that's your group. And then for channel, press and hold it for a couple seconds. Channel starts to flash, and then you can set your channel. So remember, the whole purpose of that is your group, the first one, the A through 9, is what this particular unit is assigned to. So when I'm controlling it from here or from another flash, whatever it is, when I go on here and I say take light A and set it to full power, that is this, now A. The number, the frequency of the channel rather, that is the channel that this is transmitting at. So all of my lights that I want to fire at once need to be on the same channel. They can all be in a different group. So I can control each group individually from here, but they all need to be on the same channel to be fired from here. And that's that except for the custom function. So press and hold for two seconds. It goes into custom function mode. And there's four different things to look at in here. We're going to come back to speed. We're going to finish that last. Function two, this is kind of a, a weird thing that I, I honestly do not completely understand. It is a flash delay. The manual explains it as a second curtain sync, which makes perfect sense. If you're shooting a 30th of a second exposure, for example, and you want the flash to fire in the beginning when the shutter opens, that is first or front curtain sync. If you want it to fire just before the curtain closes, just before the shutter closes, that is rear or second curtain sync. So that's what that is, and that's what I believe this is for. But there's a time delay in here, which I completely do not understand. Again, I've asked the company. They haven't responded back to me yet. But if you look at this, I can set. It's a very small delay, but I can set a delay in here. I just, I don't, I don't get it. So anyway, anybody, if anybody's watching this and actually knows what that's for, you want to educate me, please drop it into the comments. Um, otherwise, I will find out from the company eventually, and I will get back to you. Next up is the masking function. And this is another that has two settings, N1 and N2. And again, I have to admit, just don't get it. I believe, I believe it has to do with the same thing as the S1, S2, where it ignores the first pop, but it doesn't need that on the wireless. It's already got it for the optical, so I just don't get it. The manual is total Chinese English blend thing that's really hard to understand. Kind of a 
downside of the Godox equipment. The manuals are definitely not translated by a native, native English speaker, and so they're a little bit weird. I really don't quite understand what that is. Let's go to the next one, F4. F4 is your modeling lamp on or off. So this is the one that allows you to disable the modeling, laugh, modeling lamp when the flash fires or have it stay on all the time. Again, by default, it stays on all the time. I like the idea that it turns off, so I have set mine to off. Now let's go into the first function again, which is definitely the more exciting one, F1 speed mode. Standard mode would be a color accurate mode where you have a within 200 degrees Kelvin according to the manual of every of the entire power output from top to bottom. The speed mode, the color is not as accurate. There's quite a wide range of color and there's of color variance and there's actually a chart. So again, again with the charts showing you the variance in color temperature. So you can see here in the stable color temperature mode, the standard mode, it goes from 5540 up to 5674. So very, very minimal change in there. Whereas in the high speed mode, the speed mode, it varies from 5,500 degrees Kelvin up to 8,400 degrees Kelvin. That's a huge difference. And you might think, well, that's terrible to have that much light variance, color variance. Remember, you can white balance. You can do a custom white balance. So the fact that it's changing shouldn't matter. You just need to be aware of it. The advantage though, the advantage is speed. So here, let's go back to the close up here. I'm gonna leave it off for a moment, back out of here go to my lowest power possible. Let's get rid of the, the sink in there. Okay, lowest power possible, one over 3852. So remember, this is a fraction, one over one 3850 second of a second duration. Now, go into custom function. Let's turn this F1 on. Let's go back to my standard mode here, and let's take my power down to its lowest setting. And now we can get a flash duration, one over 14,814th of a second. That is massively, massively shorter duration. So this allows you to really, really freeze something. I mean, I will be doing some tests with this because I've never done photography of things like water splashes, um, certainly not bullets, not about to start doing that, but I've never done really, really high speed flash photography. This is gonna be fun to experiment with and see at what point those extreme high speeds become a benefit. But that is an incredible, incredibly short flash duration. So that's something you have in there. Again, the sacrifice, what you're giving up is color accuracy. It just jumps up to a much cooler temperature, but that's okay. Adjust the white balance and you're good to go. And that's everything on here. That is everything on this light that I want to tell you about. The next part of this is to look at the parabolic softbox. Now I realize we haven't looked at prices yet on this whole thing, so let's take a quick look over here. The Godox light itself, this is the QT 1200-2M. That's the 1200 watt second. This is the biggest one, comes in at $800, $799. If you look at the slightly smaller ones, there's a 400 watt second at 549 and a 600 watt second at 599. The parabolic softbox we're about to look at is a massive, massive beast. It's $89. Now, I don't know about you, I've bought a lot of modifiers in my time. That's cheap. That is an absolute bargain for a modifier. Now, I can't speak to the long-term quality. I've only had it for a little while. I can't speak to its light quality. Is there something weird in the silver that may be adding a color to it? Don't know yet, but that price is an absolute bargain. And I know that Godox is really striving to make very good equipment high-speed sync thing notwithstanding. Obviously, got a problem there, but they do strive to make very, very good equipment. They really are making inroads. They're really kind of slapping around some of the big boys in the industry. And with prices like that on a massive softbox like this, that's pretty cool. There's one other piece to this puzzle, the grid for the softbox. So $40 for this huge grid to go inside the softbox. So that allows you to focus. You know, focus just allows you to make a more linear light with that. So with that said, Let's go take a look at the softbox. This is the P120L. It comes in a nice handy dandy nope, little nope, container nope, like nope, this. Although nope, I don't nope, imagine. Out, gone, go, go away. I, this was out of focus. I don't know what happened right before the live show. I must've bumped that camera, knocked it out of focus. Didn't even see that until I was editing it. So not okay. So let's just start over, shall we? This is a very large parabolic softbox. You have your mount. Um, it does have a front and a back, very important. I will mention that again when I'm actually putting it together. A few different diffusion panels, an inside and an outside panel, and then the skirt to close off the hole in the back. We'll take a look at all of those. The main thing, of course, is right here. You do get with this a couple of extra fiberglass rods, which is wonderful because these will undoubtedly break at some point as you get a little aggressive trying to put this together. But this is actually remarkably easy to put together. So here's how I would recommend doing it. Put it face down grab 
the rear connector, grab the, uh, the plate, and you're going to be putting one of these rods into every single hole on here. The holes have numbers and letters on them. It doesn't matter for this, uh, for this particular application. We're using one rod in every single hole, so it doesn't matter where you go. And basically, you're just going to put it in and start bending it towards you to get the other ones into place. It, you'll see. Uh, one point of note, make sure that the mounting plate is pointing upwards. If you mount it like this, as I did the first time I put it together, then you can't attach it to the light. Silly, silly. So make sure that is up. And just grab any one to start with, doesn't matter which. Drop it into hole, doesn't matter which. And then just go to the next one and start putting them in. And in the beginning, it's going to be very easy, very quick. But as you get a little bit farther along, it will get a little bit harder. Uh, I'm about halfway here. You can see the bend on there. Right now, it's really easy to do. This is where it's going to start to get a little bit tougher. So what I recommend is simply putting this end on the ground and bending it a little bit. And as you get towards the poles that you need to put in, just put it down and force a little bit of a bend. It's fiberglass. It's meant to bend, and that will make it a bit easier. Oh, notice here, this one is slipping out of the bottom. These do go into pockets on this end of the dome. So you just got to slide that in. Looks like another one popped out here as well. Pushing down on this plate to bend it downwards tends to help a bit as well. There we go. And that, my friends, is the dome. Isn't that thing beautiful? Look at all that light. So focused, so reflected. Oh, I cannot wait to shoot with this and see what it does. Now, there is this big hole in the back. That's what the skirt is for. It's nice and easy. Now, the diffusers, I'm not going to put both of them in here, but you have two. You have the smaller inside diffuser that goes into the small Velcro tabs on the inside. And then there is the outer one, which goes all the way around the edge. Now, you also have, as an optional add-on, the grid. The grid is great because the grid will allow you to focus that light. If Instead of having such a soft wraparound light, then the grid will make it a little bit more angular, a little bit more direct. So you still get the advantages of the soft box, that nice soft light, but you get some hard edges. It's, it's kind of an odd combination. I absolutely love it. I have grids for my other boxes over here and for, for beauty dishes. And primarily for me, the general rule is I'll put the grid on if I'm photographing a man and I want to have a little bit more angular light, I'll take the grid off if I'm photographing a woman who wants some softer light. But here's what that does for you. As you can see here, as I point it towards the camera, imagine there's a light inside, how it's going to focus that light. If you're off axis a little bit, the light's not going to come through as much. Now to actually put the light on here, let me show you a little tip with that. To take off the reflector that might already be here, just push the button at the top, twist that off, and away it comes. If you have this on your light stand and you're trying to mount this onto it, because it's so big and awkward and really hard to see past it while you're trying to reach around and connect it to it, I highly recommend put the softbox on the ground, take your light off of the stand, and put it on when it's like this. And now all you have to do is line up these three pins with these three here. Does, they're all the same. It doesn't matter what the order is, so just pick any one. Put it up at the top and drop it into place. Now, once it's on, you do have to twist it to lock it. You'll have to reach around underneath this and grab onto the plate. The plate itself spins, so you need to reach out and hold that in place and lock it in. And that's all there is to it. All right, let's get back to the rest of the show. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. You've got your Godox QT1200-2M and the big old P, what was it? P120L. Isn't that a Tesla? P120D, I think. Anyway, it's a big, huge softbox. I, I'm super excited about playing with that. I've never had a parabolic softbox that size before. It's going to be a lot of fun to play with. So that'll be the next stage of this, seri of this uh, video. I'll be doing that in the near future. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed, hit that notification bell and all that good stuff so you know when that video goes live. And for those watching live, speaking of, we are about to jump into the Q&A portion of the show. If you're not watching live, just wait for it to pop up right over my face here and you'll be able to click on that and watch the Q&A. See you in a minute.